Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, supported by La Col here with Benji Nyson, the last stage of the Giro d'Italia, no ceremonial stage, the TT around, well, into Milan, it's not now and back, and it's about 30 kilometres long, a reminder of the GC standings going into it, Caruso two minutes back on Bernal, probably a bridge too far, and Yates on 323 unable to move from that spot really because the rest were about four minutes further behind Vlasov, Bade, Martinez and Carthy. Then our Mater all the way down in eighth was at 8.50. How much could he jump up as well as Foss and Martin pretty much set? So huge GC gaps, huge three-minute gaps between the last 15 riders kept this stage going on indefinitely. And the contenders for the stage win, Cavagna, Ghana, obviously, Almeida, Foss, Afini, after his good early TT, who was the first one of the first riders to set a good time, Benji? Did Afini go into the hot seat for a bit? Actually, no, because like one of the early riders that I saw starting was Ghana already. And with Ghana starting so early, then I was expecting him to do very well. I think Walshide was first and when it comes to the moment that Ghana started off. And I think Afini started a bit later than Ghana in this time trial. In terms of Ghana's start, I thought he looked good in the first few kilometers. I generally thought he's looking strong and will put in a strong performance. And his times were significantly better than Walshite's times. And I think that he was building a gap. And you know that in like other stages where there's like a flat bar and then there's an uphill bar, they might do like negative splits or something like that to try and make sure that they can base themselves on what they're strongest at. But this is completely flat. So it's kind of trying to keep that same effort for the entire stage and perhaps a bit of uh, technical parts that you do differently, but that's just the detail to that aspect then. But Gano seemed like he was ready for everything here and he was suddenly like touching his left brake first and then his right brake, so something seemed to be off. I think they were, this was with a good eight, nine kilometers to go, but I wasn't really sure what he was doing at that moment. He had a rear wheel puncture or a puncture and they eventually he had to change his bike. This is deep into the last two, three Ks. And he's been flying, you know, first at first intermediate, first at second intermediate by far. And he still was. He remained the best on those intermediate time checks. And then there was that he had to change bikes. 20 to 25 seconds at best that change cost him. And we were thinking this stage is right you know, being cracked open now because it looked like a lock for Ghana the way he was going. Yep. I mean, he said, he said he had bad legs afterwards, but um, <laughs> he obviously had pretty good legs. To um, And then Cavagna. So we were like, Cavagna is the real option to beat him now. Uh, Athene didn't set that good a time. Ghana still beat Athene by 13 seconds. And so Cavagna rolls out. And I've got the time splits here. So Cavagna, it, at the first intermediate, he's 13 seconds behind Ghana. At 10.31, Ghana 10.18. And I think Volscheid was second, actually, but he faded late. Uh, he was second, fourth, and sixth at the T1, T2, T and finish. Second intermediate, 21.55, 22.13. So Cavagna's down 18 seconds. So we're thinking, okay, he's cost himself 20 to 25 seconds, Ghana, in the t- in the bike change. But he's still obviously putting time into Cavagna on the, in, from T2 to the finish maybe five to seven seconds, it was going to be a close run thing. The betting was going up and down the live markets. Cavagna favorite, went into favoritism for a bit after T2 and then Ghana came came down as people realized actually it's going to be too difficult for Cavagna to do. And then there's a last left-hand corner. We see Cavagna going about 50 kilometers an hour on the left-hand barrier. So normally cornering go outside apex, outside. He's on the inside on the left-hand barrier. And we've got a sharp, really tight corner coming up. He sees it really, really late and goes straight pretty much and locks up his front wheel, goes over the handlebars and crashes. And that was some sort of weird, it's not karma because Cavagna did nothing wrong uh, to Gano. It's just a weird way for it to happen that the guy who was coming from maybe to contest the stage win also crashes after Ghana had a puncture and bad luck and that cost him oh I don't know it probably 12 seconds minimum <laughs> and he, a minimum he caught it cost him so he loses the stage to Ghana by 12 seconds Athene third on 13 Sobrero 
on fourth, 14 seconds. Then Almeida, fifth, 27 seconds. Volshire, sixth, 33 seconds back. Betiol, Tratnik, Moscon, Kesa making up the top 10. Our last Euro shout out for our show partner, Lacole. Obviously, they're continuing with us for the whole year. Our supporter and show partner for the entirety of 2021, Lacole, who produced performance cycling apparel. Their products are produced in Italy, the base of Monte Grappa. And the Giro discount code LRCP20 for 20% off is still active if you want to get your hands on any Lacole kit ahead of summer coming up but had you been doing any maths benji where did you before the crash of cavania did you where did you think this was gonna end up i thought gana by about a second or two i thought it would have been just cavania taking it just for a tiny bit in the end like i think that crash did take him more than the time he lost but it really doesn't really matter this is part of cycling crash and punctures no injuries preferably um but it's part of the sport and they both had their bad luck today Gana lost time on the puncture. Cavania lost time with the crash. And if both didn't have anything, then Gana would have won the time trial. So ah, it's, it nullified each other a bit, I guess, uh, on this event at least. It did make sure that everybody else was closer to them at the end. So just imagine how big the gaps would have been if they both didn't have those accidents. But I'm thinking a bit when I see a crash like the one from Cavania, just a weird thing to do, like, there's corners there everywhere, and usually I think the DS is the one that calls out which corners are coming up. Is I was considering perhaps this is perhaps the DS that didn't call it out correctly, or perhaps he didn't hear it or stuff like that. But after the finish line, I think Ghana and Cavania were talking to each other, and it looked like Cavania was, was doing hand gestures. I'm not an expert at those, but hand gestures that didn't make it sound like he was blaming someone in the car. It made it sound like he was blaming himself, that he wasn't. Uh, attentive or anything but i could be wrong about that but uh, i don't know speculating someone's to blame it's either his car has not told him left hand corner coming up maybe he's a guy that he they just let him recon the the course and he does doesn't need those call outs but maybe his earpiece had fallen out but normally you'd they'd be telling you left hand are coming up you remember in the movistar documentary in the 2019 uh, was it the bologna tt or maybe the middle tt the rainy one when they forgot to call out a corner for lander and they nearly crash and the ds is like that's my fault maybe it's the ds fault if if that's normally how they do it then that was a big error to not say short corner coming up tight corner otherwise maybe cavani was just over the limit didn't hear them and was going full and couldn't he's also i don't think his handling is the best either so when he gets himself into a sticky situation he doesn't have the skills to rectify it and yeah ended up going over the handlebars he said he was pretty sore actually uh so luckily at least he, he's not broken anything but he's he says he's he's lucky maybe it's the last stage of the giro d'italia but so that was the stage results gana was sweating nervously on that result i mean he would won probably by 25 seconds plus normally or 20 seconds plus now onto the GC men, and there was a big gap, hours waiting now, and it, uh, Yates was never moving, and the real question was how many spots could Almeida move up? And I've got the GC results here. I'll bring it up now. I've, I've tried to order it, Benji, in terms of start time, uh, which is <laughs> pretty difficult. All right, Bernal set a time of 35.41. He did what I thought was a pretty good TT Um Given that he would have been taking the last five Ks pretty easy, he came twenty fifth, I think. But Caruso wasn't able to do that good a TT. He was only thirty seconds ahead of Egan Bernal. Are you surprised by either of those performances? I think they're about par. They're they're, they're expected performances, maybe. Maybe Caruso a little bit underperforming. Yeah, I think that I was expecting a tiny bit more from Caruso, but in the end, uh, we weren't expecting Caruso to jump over Bernal, no. and they defended perfectly. Caruso probably knows that if in the first section he's not getting too much closer, and in the second section he's not getting too much closer, then he might as well just play it safely for the last section to try and actually finish this Giro without an injury. And um, he did that. He's got a second spot, and Bernal has the pink jersey. We'll do a full G- sort of Giro d'Italia recap in a separate podcast in the next couple of days. This is still just the stage recap, but yeah, Bernal cleans up the uh, Maglia Rosa in pretty dominant fashion, really controlled the race well in the last third week and controlling and doing a very good TT today, doing what he needed to do. Otherwise, from the other GC men, 
got Simon Yates. I think he came 52nd. He finished 50 seconds almost behind Egan Bernal. I think he just wrote it in. There's no reason for Yates to do a good TT today no. because he can't move up or lose spots. So third for him. Vlasov, okay. Martinez, okay as well. 35.09. Hugh Carthy was the big underperformer. Yep. 36.15. Where's that? So that's a minute and one after Vlasov. A minute more, a uh, minute and six after Martinez and Almeida 34-15, two full minutes ahead of Carthy. Um, so maybe explain to people what happened with Car- with Martinez and Almeida, Benji, because there's some maths that needs to be done. Yeah, so basically we knew that Almeida was likely to pass a Carthy and a Bardet in GC, but Martinez was pretty far ahead. And to cross that, he would need to cross a significant gap in this time trial on Martinez. Now, Almeida was doing a really good time trial. Martinez was doing a on-par time trial, not a crazy one. I, I also wouldn't say that Almeida was necessarily overperforming this time around. I know it's a nice meme, but I think that on this level, he, he was just doing a good TT, what we were expecting from him. But I didn't expect him to get close to Martinez or pass him, but... That actually became a very close thing in the end because Almeida was actually setting such a decent time while Martinez was just doing on par stuff and perhaps a bit less than I expected, which meant that they finished the time trial and the difference in GC after this time trial was half a second, meaning that Martinez is ahead of GC afterwards and Almeida is sixth, so out of the top five. Now, how is that calculated? Well, they're basically on the same time according to the GC, but they use the uh, the uh, milliseconds from both time trials to calculate where they are in the classification. And that's why the upper hand here goes to Martinez. And it's very tough for Almeida that he loses it in the same time. <laughs> I know, but I guess... Martinez is a pretty good time trialist. And does he, I don't think he'll care too much, really. He said fifth, sixth, seventh, doesn't really change my career. He wanted a stage win. I think one of the best performances in this stage was Mateo Sobrero coming fourth on, t- uh, where did he come? 34.02, that's 14 seconds after Ghana. So let's say that's really 40 seconds after Ghana, uh, accepting the puncture, which is out of Ghana's control. He even got held up by the FDJ team yeah. car. So there's a <laughs> there's a chicane. So I think Cavania crashed just before the start of the chicane, but they entered a tight chicane. And there's like, I couldn't believe the number of vehicles, the number of riders in. There's like four riders all bunched up. And Sobrero, a starter rider. Right, no, you have to ride. exaggerate. There's <laughs> at least 35. 20 riders. <laughs> there's a highway, right? There's a highway with six lorries. And um, seven Ineos, actually one Ineos Grenadier, because that, you know, The Koenig team bus on the descent of the Splugen Pass, <laughs> it's all together. <laughs> one Ineos Grenadier is enough to take up a whole road and probably the pollution <laughs> out of it will cost Sobrero 10 seconds as well. And, you know, but anyway, in reality, the FTJ car pinched him. He didn't crash. He's slapping on their door. Probably the UCI will give him a fine for disrespecting the race, most likely one would expect for that sort of thing. And he came fourth still. <laughs> So, young guy, good TT. I think he's had some good results earlier. 24 years old. He's not, not, he's about 5 foot 10, 63 kilos. So, sort of guy you could pick up. And if you're on a different sort of team, he's on a one year deal at Astana. I'd probably be signing Sobrero if I was another team next year on the cheap to see what he could do as a GC domestique. And I don't know, maybe you can win a World Tour time trial that doesn't involve Ghana and Cavania. Um, could be possible. We've got one at the Dauphiné. Come, oh, it's good. Dennis is there. Shit. Okay. It's difficult to win World Tour level time trials. Anyway, I wanted to give a shout out to Sobrero. Any other performances you wanted to make a note of, be it better or worse than expectations, Benji? I think that most of the riders performed very well. I think Kaiser is the one that I'm kind of surprised of because <laughs> it surprises me a lot that he's 10th in this time trial. Like, I did not expect that. Like, 30 kilometers, that's long for Kaiser, and we know that you can pace on the flats pretty long, but I didn't actually have him signed up as a uh, godlike TT, or well, a decent TT, to be honest, but perhaps it's just me that my memory towards Kaiser is a bit vague from the past. He's been around for quite a long time, but GC rider wise, it went expected. I think that Bardet saved his spot versus Garfi, and that's one of the big ones for me. That's one yep. of the things I didn't see coming. 
It's just because Scarfi just blatantly underperformed. <laughs> and I think that Bardet wrote a bit better than we expected. And that combination makes it that Carfi is under Bardet and GC. And I'm, yeah, he deserves it, Bardet, if he can uh, pull it off. And Carfi deserves to lose his spot if he can't pull it off. So it's uh, it's all pretty normal on that regard. I think the rest of the top 10 state exactly how we expected it to be. And for the rest of the time trial performances, I think that's all in all what we expected. I, I don't think there's like a huge oh, Foss, performance. Foss a little bit under, I think. I yeah, didn't expect Foss true. to come out of the top 10 to only finish about uh, 13, no, 23 seconds ahead of Danny Martinez. I thought he'd do better than that. I mean, being beaten by riders like Bodnar and Case a bit surprising. But otherwise, he's the final... Uh, sort of standings for everybody. So podium, Bernal, then it's Caruso, Yates, points jersey, Chiclamino, Cavagna, oh, not Cavagna, Sagan finishes the TT, so he wins Chiclamino as we expected. That competition, I think, sucked, frankly. <laughs> I think that was a cursed competition this year, though, because the riders who wore the Chiclamino then abandoned, and then Sagan having the Chiclamino meant that he rode really defensively and passively. So that competition uh, sucked. Bouchard won the Maglia Azura ahead of Bernal. I think Bernal, I think Bouchard got a little bit lucky of that Cortina stage got cancelled, Benji, because there was a lot of points on offer there or, or amended. Youth, Bernal wins it again, and Ineos win the team's classification 26 minutes ahead of Yumbo Visma. So my pick before the Giro on the potty wins Bernal. Benji will claim that if De Koenig rode for Almeida all three weeks, he would have won. Maybe you agree with that. Maybe you don't. Um, I disagree yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting words in your mouth. Yeah, <laughs> he finished seven twenty four back. So I mean, I think yeah. if they wrote for him, then he would have had the ability to try and compete for at least fourth. And yeah, that's that's probably max for me in my opinion. Right. So. Otherwise, Caruso, probably the biggest overperformance um, for anybody. I think coming second in this year, and no one expected. And crazy for Martinez to come fifth still. I mean, education first, Benji, they bet on Carthy, or rather couldn't afford to re-sign Martinez, and he's come <laughs> three spots on GC ahead of Carthy as the domestique of Egan Bernal. Um, yeah, do you see Danny Martinez as the new sort of Richie Port? Because that's the sort of hmm. I see him riding these mountains the same way. He keeps going after he's finished his job and even comes back later sometimes, like he did on Sega de Alla. I'm not sure that's the hi, I do get what you mean. I do get the comparison you mean in like rider type situation. I'd have to think about that. I can't like Both specify a certain rider. Both yeah, bad I, <laughs> <laughs> Well, so far, Martinez has been a, a bit more lucky. No, never mind. Didn't he like crash in, in the tour last year on stage three? Um, I remember I something know. vague like that. Or Higita. Like, I'm, I'm switching those around sometimes. They both <laughs> crashed. Anyway, I think it's been a good Giro for Ineos. I think Bernal, good to see him winning. I think it would have been disappointing if he uh, sort of not won because his back had, uh, had played up. So, yeah, I think it's good, but we'll cover that more in the Giro recap i think tt benji more exciting than a ceremonial sprint do you think if this had been a sprint we would have seen Molière and ewan stay the three weeks i don't think so if they just have this one sprint i mean either i don't know perhaps it would have been an incentive for someone but nah i don't think so we would have seen a, a glorious sprint with um cepeda would have stayed in the race it was sprint <laughs> Maybe. I mean, yeah, no, Benji, <laughs> we hyped, I think we've scuppered about half the Velo Games I think team by hyping did. up Cepeda. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, it's, Tour of the it's Alps. So sad, but, yeah. Everyone write yeah. down. Write down in your books, Tour of the Alps. The results from that are not necessarily indicative of what is going to happen in the Giro d'Italia afterwards. Uh, but, yeah, I think pretty pretty exciting stage, made more exciting by Ghana winning the TT I think you got any last thoughts, Benji, before we move on to the Dauphiné? I think I mainly want to thank everybody for the support we had during the uh, during the uh, Giro that we did, but we'll go ven venturing more into a thank you in our uh, full race recap, I'm guessing. But already, thank you for the support, and uh, it's been a good three weeks, but 
races aren't over and therefore the segue straight into the Dauphiné.